this is your first time, my name is Mark Warren. I'm the uh, area director for Northeast Mississippi FCA. Uh, Miss Angie Camp here is being a rep for me here in uh, Etiwamba County. Uh, we are just uh, appreciative for tonight. I know y'all are not here for me. Y'all are here for our special guest, uh, Miss uh, Blair Schaefer. Let's just go ahead and give her a round of applause. I know uh, Scott Carter, who mentored me uh, in the fellowship of Christian, the fellowship of Christian <laughs> athlete. All right, Coach Craig. And uh, he's a dear friend of mine, not just uh, a, a partner in the kingdom of God. All right, let's pray, and then uh, they're going to do one song, and Coach Gray is going to introduce who you can for. Father God, we love you. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for this group of young people, these groups of coaches and uh, people who represent ICC in this room. But most of all, we're children of God. And Father, I pray if one tonight has not uh, let their self be adopted in the family, that tonight would be their night. And Lord, maybe there's someone that's in the family of God, but they have some struggles or some things they're going through, that tonight's their night to give it up, to hand it to you, because you're the one that can take care of it. It's by Christ's power that I am made strong, not my own, but by Him. And with Him, nothing is impossible. And Father, we just ask as we just uh, sing this song of worship, we sing it unto you. And Father, we just ask that our hearts, our minds would be receptive to what Blair would have to say. And Father, you would just speak through her, speak in her, and speak for her. And in the end, you receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. And we ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Y'all stand up and worship the song with us.
And my dad is like, we're how many miles away? Like, I, I have no idea. So he tells the doctor, like, do whatever you would do for your son. So they lifeline him in helicopter to East Texas Medical Center. And by the time he gets there, he's a level four and a level five is dead. And so what happened was he was wakeboarding that morning. He was doing everything he usually does, twists, flips, whatever. Well, he landed wrong and the doctor described it as really bad whiplash. And they said that he hit his, hard, his head really hard on the water, but it compared to hitting his head on concrete. So when Logan crashed, he kind of like got out of the water and told him like, hey, I'm done, I have a headache, whatever. So he got in the water, or he got on the boat. As soon as he stood up on the boat, he threw up in the water, he fainted in the water, and he doesn't remember anything ever since. And so they life led him to the hospital. By the time he got there, level, he was level four, level five was dead. What happened was a blood vessel pulled apart in his brain. And you have thousands of blood vessels. And so the first, the first miracle was the fact that when the doctors cut open his skull, they found the blood vessel that pulled apart. He said it was like a water hose. And it was just, it was bleeding. Well, his brain shifted 75% to one side. Well, when you have all that trauma to your brain, you never know how the person's going to respond. And the doctors told me, being his twin sister, that I was going to have to feed my brother for the rest of his life, that he was going to be in a diaper, and that he would never have a quality of life. And so for me, that was really hard. First of all, I left Ohio, by the way. Didn't stay. My dad asked me if I wanted to stay. I was like, absolutely not. He left. We went to the hospital. So we're hearing all this from the doctor. And me being his twin, I'm like, we're at the same age. Like, we're supposed to be doing the same things. I'm not supposed to be feeding my brother. But I didn't ever think of it as, why me? Like, I think a lot of the time, sometimes we can be like, wow, we do everything right. Our family is such a good family. We live, like, with Christ as our just foundation. Like, why me? And instead, you, we should be looking to God and being like, you know what? I don't understand, but you have a purpose. You have a plan, and we have to trust that. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. And for me, that was really hard to do. But I feel like that was the first time where I had to actually step into my faith where I couldn't see what was going to happen. Yeah. And, and believe that he had Logan in his hands. So they went into surgery, they found the um, blood vessel that pulled apart, and Logan went into a coma for four or five days. So the doctor said, when, when you're in a coma, they can hear you, so you just keep talking to them. And so we did, we kept talking to Logan, and obviously he didn't respond. But one day, my mom was like, Logan, if you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. And it was like he had spent all of his, just the whole day building up all this energy to give us this one little thumbs up, and then it was back down, and it was nothing. And we tried it again after that, nothing, nothing, nothing. But that one time, my mom was like, Logan, if you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. And he did very slowly, and then he went back down, and then he started shaking again. He shook for over 72 hours nonstop, sweats. And so he went back to his normal state of mind. But that was another glimpse of God being like, you know what? He's healing, I have him. And Logan ended up getting out of the ICU unit after a week. So four days, four or five days, he was in a coma. On day seven, he was out of the ICU unit, which is a complete miracle. He ends up going in a regular room, ends up getting accepted into the number one rehab facility in the nation in Tier, in Houston, Texas. So when you get accepted into Tier, you get on a floor. There's five floors. He was on the fifth floor, which is all for brain patients. So I don't know if you guys remember, but um, probably like eight years ago, there was like some, I don't remember what she did. She was like a, in the government in Arizona and she got shot in the head. Do y'all know what I'm talking yeah. about? Okay, well she was in the same floor as Logan. And so that, the fact that he was admitted into that program where people were on a waiting list for years and months to get there is just crazy. So Logan was there, he had to learn how to walk again, talk again, and eat. I fed my brother for two weeks. Surprised him because I didn't play AAU that summer. I gave it all up to be with him because I didn't know if he was going to live, if he was going to get better or worse, because you just don't know with brain patients. And so Logan ended up learning how to walk in, talk in, feed himself, go to the bathroom, and he's like in seventh, eighth grade at this point, so he shouldn't have to be doing these things when you're that age, but he did. And he did it with ease. Like he was showing everybody up in the rehab facility, and so Logan ended up leaving the rehab facility after I think 39 days. And what's crazy is, like, there's a spiritual biblical number of 40 in the Bible, all throughout the Bible. And so it was like some preacher came up to Logan and told him, like, you're going to leave this place before 40 days. And we were like, are you kidding? Like, Logan's brain just shifted 75% to one side. He's not even responding. And you're saying that he's going to 
fully recover and leave this place before 40 days. Like it was crazy, but he did. And so that was the first time where I was just like, wow, my faith is like, it's, it's been tested, but it's grown. Yeah. And, and I feel like it's such a blessing to have my brother still alive. One, because when you have a brain patient, you just don't know. Two, there's people that are still on four or five and when my brother was there, and that's eight years ago, and they're not any better. And so it's like, that could have been my brother, but it's not. And so I feel like for that, like we have to glorify him because that's all him, it's not us. We have no, we have no control over that. And so that was the first time where my faith was really tested. And then, um, I obviously am from Texas. My dad got the head coaching job at Mississippi State when I was a junior. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in the middle of high school, but it is very hard. Um, and so I, we obviously gave everything up and was like, you know what, this is the best thing for my dad. We don't know what is about to happen, but we're just going to go. So we moved to Mississippi, started playing ball in high school, and I was getting recruited. My dad obviously wanted me to play for him my whole life. And I'm just going to tell you right now, it's never going to work if you want to play for your parent unless you'll have the right attitude and mindset, just so you know. So you all have to have a really special relationship. <laughs> Praise God, we had that relationship, but it's not for everybody, so I totally understand. That's right. Um, but anyway, so my junior year, I wrote my dad a letter. They went on this like Thanksgiving tournament, told him I wanted to come to state, and I was so excited. And, and you guys know, when you're in high school, you're usually like the best person on your team if you're getting recruited for college, or you're one of the best people. And so I think that's a very hard thing to transition through when you go from high school to college, because you go from being the best, and then you're back on ground zero, and you have to prove yourself all over again. Because it's like, no one cares if you were All-American or whatever, because now you're playing against people who have SEC experience or whatever league you're going into. And now they're, you're a warm face. And so I, I went my freshman year. I, I didn't bar barely play at all. Uh, I think I averaged six minutes a game. And I don't even remember checking into six games, if I'm being quite honest. And so that was really hard for me. And I think the biggest thing was like, just wondering like wow I worked so hard in high school and I was the best in high school and so why isn't it the same well the truth is my work ethic was the same for a league that was ten times better mm -hmm. and so you have to change and I think sometimes it's hard for us to look in the mirror and be like how should I change like I'm the greatest thing ever and you're really not and so <laughs> my freshman year six minutes sophomore year nothing really changed I averaged 13 minutes a game and it, it didn't seem like my purpose was being fulfilled. When really, I can tell you this, we think that we know our purpose, but sometimes we don't because only he knows our purpose and he will unfold it for us the way he wants it to be unfolded. And so my after my sophomore year, I had a mental breakdown. I thought about it for weeks and then I finally went to my mom first and I told her like, hey, I think I want to transfer. And no one knew, my brother didn't even know. It was just between me and my mom my mom was so supportive and she's like i'll do whatever you want me to do but you have to like obviously tell your dad which was very hard because he's also the head coach so he comes <laughs> home one day and i told him like hey dad um i want to i think i just want to transfer and it like i think it struck him like completely out of nowhere because i was always the kind of person to like hit things head on and like grow from it and get better and, and not shy away from anything and this is the first time in my life that i was just i was going to do that and I can tell you sometimes I think the grass is greener on the other side and it's not. And that was what I thought. I thought the grass was greener somebody else or somewhere else and I was going to be able to go and I was going to play four, 40 minutes a game and, and be the impact player I wanted to be because quite frankly, like I was making an impact off the court. I was on all the community service teams. I was giving back to the community and it was great, but I wasn't fulfilling what I thought was my purpose on the court. And so that was really hard for me. So as soon as my dad comes in, I tell him, obviously, and you guys know we separated father, daughter, coach, and player very well. So the first thing he says in the house is, you can come to my office the next day and we'll take it up there. So I came to his <laughs> office and <laughs> so I told him and we just talked. But I think the best thing for me was that the whole time we didn't talk about other places that I could go. We talked about things that I could change for me so that I could see the result that I wanted to see. And so my whole coaching staff, I mean, they were behind me 100%. We talked about my weaknesses, we talked about my strengths, and we talked about what this summer between my sophomore and junior year had to look like if I was going to change and change results on the floor. So that was probably one of my hardest summers ever. Um, I told them I needed to work on ball handling. 
obviously in the SEC, people are quicker, faster, stronger, taller, everything. And obviously, a five-seven slow guard is not. It's it's not supposed to work on paper. Like, let's just be honest. I'm not supposed to work in the SEC. Okay. And so I think sometimes when you think about it, especially me, I can be like, I'm not. I'm not supposed to work. So let me just figure out another like team that I'll work on best where they can use my three-point shooting, my help side defense, whatever. So that summer we worked on everything that was really hard for me. So then my junior year happened. Um, I didn't really start until the NCAA tournament. And that was a big, a big deal to not only like the new starting five, but everyone in the community because it was the first round we were hosting at the home. Everyone thought my dad was insane. He benched Victoria, he benched Brianna Richardson, Dominique Dillingham, you guys know these names. They played a lot of minutes. They did a lot of great things for us. Yeah. But at this time, we were offensively stagnant. And so sometimes you have a lot of influence on the outside and they have no idea what's going on on the inside. And so sometimes change is necessary. And so he changed the entire starting five. And people were like, you're crazy. Like, you have a good team coming into the hump, and this is not the time to try and prove something or whatever's going on. And so we came out, and we ended up being so much better offensively. It was crazy. And I think the, the first, that was another moment for me where I was just like, all my hard work has paid off. Because I came out the first round, I scored 21 points. Well, I had never scored 21 points in my entire career, so everyone was like, Vic, what have you done with her the past three years? Like, why has she not played? But in reality, I haven't been putting in the work. I changed my work ethic, and I didn't announce it to the public, so no one knew. They just saw my results that changed. But I feel like that was part of my faith. Like, I had to believe in something I couldn't see. And my coaches were there. They were my backbone, and they were the ones who helped me push forward. And I feel like you guys have the same. Y'all have all these coaches that are trying to get the best out of you. And sometimes, you know, we can we can like push them away and be like, you're trying to be too hard on me, or you see something that I can't do, but they wouldn't be on you if they didn't see something deeper within you. And I figured that out myself. And so junior year came, 21 points the first game, everyone thought it was a fluke. Come back the second round, I had 18 points. And so people were like, what's going on? Like state is scoring in the 90s now, and we were scoring like 60s, and it was ridiculous. And it was with five people that hadn't played all year. But reality was, in practice, we were grinding every day against the five people that played great. And when you play against great people, you become better yourself. And so that's another positive thing that we can get out of having a good team. Sometimes you think, like, I have great teammates, and I'm never going to play over them. But when you go head to head with them every day, you're only going to become better. And so it's going to show someday. And that's what it did for us. And, and so we, we persevered, and we go and play Washington against Kelsey Plum. I don't know if you guys know who she is, but she played for Washington. She's like the all-time leading scorer for women's basketball. She's amazing. Well, we shut her down. We won that game. We go play Baylor. Morgan drops 41 points. We go to the Final Four. It was amazing. And I started to kind of see like my purpose and something that I could help my team out with. And so I feel like every year, especially when you're in college, you have a different role. Like your freshman year, you have a different role than your sophomore and junior and senior year because you become more mature, more things are put on your shoulders, you can handle more, you know how to handle it as well. Sometimes when we're young, we think like, oh, I know. Like, you don't have to tell me, I know how to handle it. And like, that was me. Like, I went in my freshman year, I thought I knew. Obviously, I was clueless because I had never played in the SEC before. So after my junior year, um, we ended up obviously going to the national championship. We didn't win, sorry, it's annoying, whatever. Um, so then I was thinking, how can I make my senior year better than my junior year? Because I had a really good junior year. People started to kind of see like what I could do on the floor because I changed. And I was like, how can I become better? So I had to figure out how I could become quicker, faster, stronger because I was shorter than everybody. Um, I wasn't like, I went against probably like six foot, six one guards. I'm like 5'7 on a good day, so I had to figure something out. And obviously I'm not the fastest person, so how can I impact people on my team even though I'm not necessarily the quickest? And so I figured it out. So I had to look at myself in the mirror and be like, what three things could I add to my team? And if they needed it, the coaching would be like, Blair needs to be in. And so I figured out, you know, I'm going to be a three-point threat. I'm going to have help side defense. If someone gets beat off the bounce, which we did because you guys know we play really hard. So obviously when you play that hard, you're liable to get beat. That's fine. You have to have somebody help in the paint. So I was like, three point, help in the paint, and I'm going to be a bomb screener. Like, if you need a screen, <laughs> just check me in. And so I was. I was a really good screener. And sometimes he would check me in just to set a screen. Like, And I would be setting a screen against five players. So I 
know most of the time you guys see me get knocked down and that's totally fine because it's foul and then we get the point, but I don't care. So it worked. So those are my three things that I figured out and it gave me more playing time. Well, I obviously still worked on my ball handling and some of my other weaknesses this summer between my junior and senior year. Well, I go from averaging six minutes my freshman year to averaging the most minutes my senior year. Again, with, with players on my team that I should not be playing more minutes, Tierra McCown, I should not be playing more than her. I should not be playing more than Victoria Vivians or Morgan William or Roe Johnson. They're all quicker, faster, stronger. But my role that I had to play fit within the team and it helped everybody. I was the glue for our team. I had leadership. I was the vocal person on our team. I, not, I might not be the one getting the ball to score the game winner, but I knew how to bring everyone together and help them know what was about to happen. And it's like when I was off the court, something was missing. And I feel like sometimes I was the coach on the court, and you gotta have that. You gotta have that person that gets everyone together and tells them what they don't want to hear sometimes. That way they get it together, and that way you can go to the next play and make it happen. And I feel like that's what I did. And so six minutes a game to like 30, I think I averaged like 38 minutes a game my senior year. Um, but God tested me my, let's see, it was January 3rd. He tested me January 3rd. I had worked so hard. I, I was doing great things. SEC play had started. And then we did this new thing my senior year. Every, the, every senior was going to have a home game that represented them. Well, my home game was versus Arkansas. And Arkansas was January 4th. January 3rd, I got hurt. But nobody knew. So I got hit by a screen I didn't see coming. My shoulder went into my body. My whole arm went numb. Didn't feel it. Usually when I get hurt, you know, I usually get back up. That didn't happen. I told my dad, like, hey, I just need like five, ten minutes. He was like, fine. So he subbed someone else in. I was on the sideline. About five, ten minutes later, he throws me a chest pass, and he's like, hey, are you okay? And I went to put both my arms up, and one wouldn't go up. And so here I am thinking I've worked so hard, and tomorrow is my senior game. Everyone's coming to, to celebrate me, and I'm not going to be able to play. So I went, and... I went to Columbus, I got two steroid shots in my shoulder, one in the front, one in the back. He told me, I was like, either going to be able to feel my shoulder again, or it was just going to be a slow healing process and I wasn't going to be able to play. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to take this leap of faith and just pray to God that he's going to touch my shoulder. So one in the front, one in the back. About 10 minutes later, I started getting a tingling feeling back in my, my fingers. And so he was like, go get some rest. I said, before you go to bed, so I did. Next morning comes, I ice it, I'm feeling extremely stiff. I go and shoot, it was at probably like 9 a.m. I didn't have class that day, but it was game day. So 9 a.m. I go to the gym, I can't shoot past the block. And I'm like, this is never gonna work because he doesn't put me in the game to shoot jump shots. So um, Julie, my trainer, she tells me, we're gonna go get treatment, we're gonna come back at like 11. So I did, I come back at 11, I can shoot from the free throw line and that was about it, but my shoulder was popping. It was popping in and out, so I was like, that's not really good. So they get you a brace, and um, I took a Toradol an hour before the game, which is basically the strongest medicine you can take to try and take pain away. I'm sure you guys know this. Um, and so, all glory to God, I ended up making six threes that game, and I couldn't shoot past the block that morning. How? I have no idea, but it's a God thing. And I feel like when you literally lean everything into him, he will fulfill your purpose and he will answer you. But if you're halfway in, it's never going to work. If you're only like a fourth of the way in and you're sketching off the, the three fourths, you're not all in. And so I feel like for me, I was literally all in. I was like, you got it. You do whatever you want me to do with my life. And and that was that was what he did. He gave me six threes. He got me through the season. And originally they just told me I had several scans done in my shoulder. They told me, like, hey, you just have a bone chip in your shoulder. Well, you guys know if something's wrong with your body, you know, and you know it's more than a bone chip if it feels more than a bone chip. And that was how I felt, but I didn't say anything. I just got treatment, got me through the season. We had a great senior year. It was the best thing ever. Um, I ended up making the all-defensive team my 5-6 self, made the all-defensive team in the SEC. If you would have told me my freshman year, freshman player that played six minutes a game that I was going to make the all-defensive team, I would have laughed in your face because it just doesn't happen. But I made the all-defensive team because of my purpose. My purpose was to be in help side. When you take charges, that's on defense, right? So everyone can play defense differently. You can be on ball. You can be in help side. You can do 
you can have steals, like you can make the team because of numerous things and I did, I found my purpose. So I made I made the all defensive team. I ended up being SEC Scholar Athlete of the Year. I worked so hard all four years to have a great GPA in biological science and although that is not my purpose now, <laughs> it's fine. That's right. Because it has got me so far in so many things and it's, it's taught me more than just what science can do. It's taught me how to work hard, how to stay up late, how to push through things that are uncomfortable because you're gonna, you have to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. And I feel like that's what I did. And so um, after my senior year was over, I got my shoulder checked out. Um, they told me originally like in January that I had a bone chip. And so they didn't really know how bad it was until they went into surgery. They go into surgery, turns out my whole backside of my shoulder was torn. They had to put five anchors in my shoulder. They stitched the cartilage back to my bone. They shaved the front part of my clavicle because it was cutting into my cartilage in the front. And they took the bone chip out. So I played my senior year since January with that. But I feel like there was no way I could have got through my senior year if I didn't have someone bigger that was helping me along the way. Yeah. And it's more than just our trainers. Like, our trainers do great things for us. I'm not taking anything away. I feel like God pours into them so that they can pour into us and bless us, thank God. But <laughs> it's him. Like, he, he had his hands on my shoulder the whole season. He literally kept me in one piece. And so when you have something like that that's wrong with you, but you can get through and do such great things, I feel like there's just baby steps along the way that builds up, and then it's like, man, it just unfolds in front of your face. And it's like, who else can create that except for him? You know, and I feel like that's the same with all of us in here. Like we all play different sports. We some of us don't play sport, and that's totally fine. You have a purpose in this life, and I feel like you're not going to know what that is until you really fully go after God. Yeah. You have to really reach after Him and lean on Him, and it's not always the cool thing. I'll tell you, I was in a locker room sometimes where everybody was talking about my dad or the coaching staff, and I could be easily that person to go tell him everything that's going on. But sometimes you just have to lean on somebody greater, have him handle it because it's not in your hands to handle. And so each of us has something greater in this life. And you may not know your purpose now, and it's fine, because eight years ago I didn't know my purpose. And now I, I know the small purposes I've had through my sport that have allowed me to touch other people's lives, hopefully, like you guys. And so I'm here to tell you, like, sometimes you're not going to know. It's not going to be clear. You're going to have really bad things happen to you. You're going to have bad things happen to your family members, your friends. And it's, it's going to be really easy to be like, wow, God, why would you do this? You know? But I feel like now in my life, I'm at the point where, like, everything happens for a reason. Everything is because of him. And so you don't question anything. You just pray about it and leave it up to him because that's that's all we can do. We have we, we think we have a purpose for uh, for ourselves, but really he has it all written out already. And the more we try and write our own, the more it doesn't work. You know, we have we have to lean on him. He it's already written. And and so my thing is, I want to pray that each of you guys try and lift each other up and find each other's purpose, make each other better, challenge each other. But there's a way to challenge each other to get the best out of everyone. And so I just, I encourage you guys to find that balance. Find your teammates in your sport, lift them up. You're obviously gonna have your more challenging teammates. You're gonna have things that will never, you will never get credit for some of the things that you've done. But at the end of the day, he knows what you've done and that's enough. I mean, for me, there's one more short story. For me, you guys know Tierra, Tierra McCallum. She's preseason player of the year this year. Well. On our team, we have sisters, we have buddies. And so Tierra was my buddy. And I'm probably one of the most encouraging people on my team. Like, you could tell me, like, all these cuss words in the book, and I'd be like, great, let's go. <laughs> and so that's probably why Tierra was my sister, because she can get down on herself really easily. Well, she runs by me in practice. Preseason, we do, um, we do the mile run. We do conditioning, but we do it off the track. So, Basically, the mile run for us is like a, a toughness test. Like, obviously, you don't have to run a mile in basketball, but who can push through four laps and go as fast as they can? It's a toughness test. So we always do that. So I, by the time I would finish my four laps, Tierra would just be finishing her third. So I would run five laps because I would push her to be better. And so finally, my senior year, we were sisters again. I finished my fourth lap. I catch up with Tierra. There's three guards in front of her. Well, sometimes I literally just told you guys, you have you know how to motivate people differently. Well, Tierra, the first guard was about 50 feet in front of us. And I was like, really, you're going to let so-and-so beat you? Really, Tierra? I said, at this cone, we're going. 
Next thing you know, at this, she, well, first of all, she's like, I can't do it. And she's like, oh, I don't care. Then she has a couple of choice words at me, and I'm like, I don't care. Like, we're going at this cone. I'm going without you, so you can stay back or you can push forward. Next thing you know, he gets the cone. She pushes. She beats this one guard. First of all, post players don't ever beat guards in the mile, especially a 6'7 All American, 250 is here on the calendar, whatever she weighs. So she beats this first guard. Next thing you know, around the corner, I'm like, you have so and so. I was like, we can do this. You just beat her. And now she's feeling sorry for herself. We're going to beat another one. And so I said, at this curve, we're going. And she's like, I can't. I got a cramp. I'm not <laughs> my leg. I said, I don't care. I said, you got this. Like, you have to put it in someone else's mind that they can do something. And then slow enough, they start to believe it. And so next thing you know, Tierra beats that guard and she beats the other guard. And she's the first post ever to beat three guards in the mile. But you would never, no one ever knows that Tierra McAllen has attitude checks sometimes because you have so many positive people around her, it counteracts. So yeah. people don't see it because you have these positive people. When you have positive people constantly around you, you start thinking positive and you no longer have those negative effects, those negative thoughts, effects, whatever. And so anyways, during practice, you know, she'll have her moments and it doesn't matter who it is. She could hate everyone on the team, but if I come up to her, she has so much respect for me because she knows I'm trying to make her better. And I, she knows that I don't do things that she does. And I know that she doesn't do things that I do. And I think that's what made us so great because at the end of the day, we had each other's back. Tierra had my back, but it builds up because of respect. We always wanted the best for each other. She was going to block someone's shot. I obviously got beat off the bounce a lot. She obviously blocked their shot a lot. And so I had her back too. Obviously, when you have a post player that shoots threes out on the perimeter, it's hard for her, it's hard for Tierra to guard on the perimeter because she doesn't have a quick first step. So she'll get beat, but I'll be in the lane. And so it's like everything happens for a reason, but Tierra is so much better than she was her freshman year because of small people around her that don't get credit to the public, but they're part of her team and they've made her better. And I feel like that's what you guys can do. You know, you're always gonna have someone better on your team. You're always gonna have someone quicker, faster, stronger. But you can be that positive person and be like, hey man, let's go, it's fine. Like, it's one play, get over it, get to the next one. And and I feel like once you guys start seeing the best in your teammates, they're going to start seeing the best in yourself and it's going to make everybody better, okay? And so you guys are the faith of your team. And I feel like the more that you guys pour out to your teammates, the more that your team is going to be a, a faith center team too. And I'll just tell you, I'll be the first one to tell you, the stronger your team is with their faith, the, the better it's going to play out over everything. Because in the hardest moments, that's when your true character shows. And our true character showed in this past year and it got us through so many things. So I'm going to leave you with that. I thank you guys for letting me come and pour into you guys. And I pray that you guys start pouring into other people as well. One of the things she said that I like the most is she said it's the uncomfortable things, doing the uncomfortable, that will get you comfortable with the uncomfortable. And that's not just in our sport, that's in our faith as well. I mean, how many people don't raise your hands would say, hey, I've shared my faith, I've shared my life story, I've shared my testimony with a teammate, I've, I've shared it with a group of people like this. And you say, no, I'm not a speaker, I'm not called to preach, I'm not called to do this. I'll never, ever do that. And see, I, I just want to say it this way, really and truly, especially, in Christ, the only wall ever put in front of you is put there by you. The only in sport, in life, in godliness, ninety-nine point nine 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 percent of the time, the only walls that stay up in your life are the ones that you allow. There are things. The impossible things that you think here that can be done in your sport, in your academics, and most of all, for the kingdom of God. There is nothing stopping you most of the time but you. Not even the devil can stop you. And we blame it on him all the time, especially in our faith. He said that we're the church and that this right here, the church... The gates of hell cannot prevail. Because church is me. Church is not the building you go to on Sunday mornings. It's me. I'm the church. 
When I go in Walmart, church should happen. Because why? Church is me. <laughs> the only things in life, I love that. You got to sometimes do the uncomfortable things so that sooner or later they become comfortable. Uh, Blair, just one thing. I, you went through, I just want to hear this story. You went through one of the, oh man, the greatest game in state history ever played in beating the team that, you know, we think is unbeatable, UConn. And then, of course, your senior year, you lost in the worst way <laughs> imaginable. Just, I mean, just a snip bit. Just give me a little bit of something in that game that you will remember for the rest of your life besides even Biddy's last second shot. But just something from that UConn game and then uh, we can leave the other one, Notre Dame alone. <laughs> uh, Something I will never forget is the fact that Gino did not take a timeout in the first half because he thought his team was going to figure it out without coaching. At some point, you need someone to get up your butt and be like, listen, it ain't getting to that. <laughs> so he thought his team that was full of, like, you know, all Americans and Team USA, that they were going to come together, but at, at some point they weren't and they had to adjust. And so I will never forget, if my dad ever waited a half to call a timeout, I would call one for him. <laughs> like if it wasn't working. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, that game was really special, especially Mo. I mean, she's a really special person. And we were roommates for four years, so she's obviously like my best friend. But we obviously couldn't go out to eat after that because she was a celebrity and got bombarded everywhere. So I ate by myself for a while. Just what it is. But uh, you, you, you did great things, and uh, uh, most of all, I've, I've heard great things, especially through Jimmy Gilbert, their FCA, Mississippi State, that most of all, you're a great young lady. Thank you. And uh, we, we pray to bless the best upon you. Uh, Y'all, if you would, and then we'll, we can give her a, an applause, let's just stretch our hands towards Blair. And uh, we just want to bless her. Uh, this is the greatest blessing we can give her than any seed of money or anything like that. And Blair's come here, uh, of course, out of her own heart, and we want to bless her. Father God, we just bless Blair. Uh, we thank you for the purposes that you have fulfilled in her life. But Lord, I pray even for the purposes that have not yet been fulfilled. And Father, that we uh, heed to the word that says we lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways we acknowledge you and you direct our path and that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. And I believe good things have happened in our way, even through the tragedies of our life, that the Word says all things work together uh, for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, that that doesn't mean that everything that has happened to her has been good or around her has been good, but through the circumstances of learning in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the storm, and in the midst of the circumstance that good has come through it. And Lord God, I just pray that you would keep allowing her to share her story more and more and more. And because of it, people will come to know you better and better and better. And that her future is great because her future is in your hands. And she's allowing you to work it. And we ask all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, y'all give her a round of applause.